Great. Thanks very much for the introduction and um, for um, taking some time to come out and listen to me today. Uh, to begin with, I guess, some disclosures. Um, these are my current disclosures, and none of them really are relevant for this particular talk. So uh, today, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about adherence um, across a variety of health behaviors, uh, talk a little bit about um, some checklists of adherence items that um, you can attend to that you might find um, helpful in your practices, and um, a little bit about um, the communication style that best supports self-management with, um, in, within your practice. So to begin with, of course, we know that uh, adherence refers to a cluster of behaviors. It's the extent, of course, to which the patient's behavior corresponds with an agreed upon plan, right? So this is a very patient-centered type of definition uh, to contrast with the traditional approach of um, uh, effectively lecturing and telling our patients what it is that they need to do immediately. So of course, like it's also important to point out when we consider adherence that um, Oftentimes, we simply think of adherence and um, pill-taking behavior, but of course, the cornerstone of management for chronic disease, for hypertension, is lifestyle modification, changes to diet and exercise. And what's interesting, of course, is that many of our patients know a lot about these issues. Some of them know more than we know about these issues. And the difficulty, oftentimes, is not so much that people don't know what to do, it's that they simply don't do what they know. Um, we do know, however, that there's also a lot of confusion, as pointed out earlier today in a previous talk by Deborah Reed. There's a lot of misinformation. The one that's driving me crazy, maybe you've heard of this one, is the, uh, the Big Fat Surprise, that recent uh, book that's causing havoc for, I think, most dietitians. So hypertension management, of course, means behavior change. Um, of course, non-adherence is a major problem. We look at um, clinical outcomes. I could spend um, 30 minutes discussing all of these. Um, it's bad when people don't take their pills. Uh, they need to be taking their pills. They need to be engaging in health behaviors as well. Otherwise, you see these sorts of um, negative endpoints. So um, in your own practices, what percentage of your patients do you feel actually do what you tell them to do? <laughs> let's say, um, uh, let's say take, your, take their medication as prescribed. What would you say, just by a shout out? 50%. 50% you figure, right? Yeah, anyone else? Oh, I, I think I set this up too, uh, too harshly. You're all sort of uh, being very modest. Um, you know, oftentimes when I ask that question to Dr. Blue, people will tell me, all of my patients, yeah. I think with geriatrics, they're more compliant, so I would say 75, 80 percent. Okay, so there are um, some suggestions that across the lifespan there are differences in adherence, and, and that's quite possible. Overall, let me give you an average from, um, from Canadian data. Um, there's about a 50 percent non-adherence rate. Now, you know, um, that's for people who fill. So if we look at people who actually like um, take the time, if we consider the people who don't fill, uh, and then those who are non-adherent, overall there's about a 35% um, adherence rate. Now some of you might be sort of shocked by that. That has um, been uh, uh, replicated uh, time and time again. And in Canada, for example, when we look at common medications that are prescribed, statins for example, there's typically an, a 50% um, uh, discontinuation rate within the first year uh, of prescription. And that's for those people who actually fill. So that's uh, kind of interesting. When we look at the targets for health behaviors. Again, we can see, as was mentioned earlier, that when it comes to diet and exercise, things do not look particularly good. And these things, of course, are consistently associated with, with, um, with blood pressure status. So of course, there's um, some dimensions of, of non-adherence that need to be taken care of. Um, we often tend to focus on the patient. Um, what it is that they're not doing, what their personal characteristics are, and so on. But of course, um, adherence arguably is um, as large an issue with respect to what the provider does in their interactions with the patient, and of course the systems that support or, um, or don't so much support the, um, the, the, uh, the adherence. Uh, I'm going to touch on a couple of these things today. We'll start with provider factors, okay, because uh, oftentimes these are sort of overlooked. And um, we know, for example, that poor communication styles associated with non-adherence, you might be interested to know that most complaints that patients have about their, um, uh, about their healthcare providers, physicians in particular, reflect not so much concerns about competency or their inability to, to prescribe appropriately. Uh, it's poor communication. My doctor didn't listen to me, they're not paying attention, and so on. And we know very clearly that this is linked to, um, uh, to, to adherence. Uh, 
We know that like the uh, traditional kind of communication style, which involves lecturing patients, telling them, providing them with information and advice, the passive recipient of the information, the patient sort of nodding their head, sitting there, um, telling you they're going to do it, but you wonder if it's going to happen or not, that that's sort of effective for a minority of patients. Five to 10% of patients typically do well with that kind of approach. The vast majority do not. Um, and this is, of course, a very frustrating situation for providers when you are discussing smoking cessation or changing diet or starting a new medication or whatever, and um, you, know, you know you're not getting anywhere. Um, people come back and they haven't lost weight. You look outside and the person who tells you they stopped smoking are lighting up in the uh, parking lot or they've got yellowed fingers and so on. Um, I think this is sort of all familiar to us. So, um, of course, there are patient factors as well. Um, socioeconomic status, for example, is associated with adherence, that's for sure. And there's condition and therapy-related adherence factors. Of course, uh, hypertension is the silent killer, so it doesn't have obvious symptoms. Um, some patients, you know, you may experience this regularly, will say that they will take their antihypertensives when they feel their blood pressure is high. Um, this is not a good idea, uh, obviously. Um, and of course, like uh, lecturing the patient about the uh, problems with that kind of behavior, typically not so effective in terms of motivating health behavior change. So uh, you made a diagnosis, you're seeing your patient, you've prescribed a treatment path, uh, maybe they give them an exercise prescription, a prescription for, for antihypertensive medication. Uh, what do you do now? Arguably the best thing to do is to switch now from the find and fix, teach and tell kind of approach to a more collaborative, um, empowering the patient type of approach. So moving from an expert sort of role to a coaching type of role. Because of course the outcomes that you're interested in they're more related to what the patient does, obviously, in between the appointments. They need to be doing things, changing their behavior, whether it's pill taking, uh, moving more, uh, eating differently, reading less. Those are the things that matter. And of course, we can't force the patients to change, and no amount of cajoling or yelling or uh, lecturing is, go is going to sort of improve that situation. In fact, arguably, the pitch that I often make when it comes to efforts to improve adherence, it needs to be time neutral or time savings for you. You need to be doing less of the talking and lecturing and have the patient doing more of the work themselves. Uh, it's an incredibly frustrating situation when I do talks like this for groups of um, specialist physicians, for example, who will tell me you know, in a sleep apnea clinic that they haven't had any patient successfully lose weight in years and that sort of thing. And in my mind, it reflects sort of um, a sort of consultation style that's inconsistent with what the evidence tells us works best. So um, I'm going to run through a few checklists for you today just as an introduction to this sort of thing. Um, this simple kind of scheme is developed by the um, Center for Disease Control in the US, um, and it reflects, um, the acronym reflects simplifying regimen, imparting knowledge, uh, behavior modification, communicating in a way that's effective, um, being careful to acknowledge um, bias that I think arguably we all have as healthcare providers, and then evaluating adherence properly. So in terms of simplifying the regimen, some of these recommendations you'll see on the Hypertension Canada website, pretty basic. Obviously, like trying to simplify timing, frequency, amount, and dosage. We've already heard a little bit about um, combination medication today, and there's a talk, of course, at noon from Ross Feldman who's going to follow up on that. Um, this seems like a particularly good idea. Um, obviously, like um, uh, packaging is important, blister packaging. Uh, that sort of thing, uh, enc encouraging adherence aids. There are a number of like um, tech products available now, apps that um, I can uh, speak about afterwards if you like, um, that arguably um, are beginning to kind of emerge that shows some reasonable evidence to improve, to improve adherence. Um, these are like, um, uh, involve everything from um, pill containers that will glow or buzz when it's time to take the medication to uh, text messaging, sophisticated text messaging that learns about your patients, what their preferences are, and cues them appropriately. So that's sort of like um, coming soon. Uh, the eye of simple imparting knowledge, uh, focusing on the shared decision-making model, obviously, and trying to also include uh, a variety of healthcare professionals. We know that when pharmacists, for example, are included in par as part of a treatment team, that um, outcomes are better for blood pressure control consistently. There's a large body of research from Barry Cooper in Chicago that demonstrates this um, over and over again, that they're an arguably an underused healthcare professional who can uh, significantly um, improve um, uh, blood pressure control by providing feedback to both the patient and the physician. That's um, uh, an interesting one to consider. 
of course, like trying to um, provide the prescription instructions in a way that's understood by the patient, um, using appropriate internet aids, because of course we all know that the patients will come in um, having Googled their condition, uh, having looked at various sites, some of which are inflammatory and problematic, and some of which um, arguably are much better. So you, uh, you know, might want to figure out whether they're doing this and then direct them to, uh, to sites that you know are appropriate and accurate. And of course, re reinforcing discussions. So in terms of the imparting knowledge, again, uh, without having too much time to get into it, I will say like, um, that this um, is significantly different from the tr traditional kind of approach where you're doing all of the talking. The idea, for example, would be to ask patients what it is they've understood about what you've discussed at each consultation. Because we know that about 50% of all of the information during a typical um, primary care exchange is forgotten by the patient and almost half of it is misremembered. So you might think, I did a wonderful job explaining this uh, you know, medication regimen. I gave some good advice and tips. I killed it. This person is going to know exactly what to do. Uh, sometimes when we ask the patient to repeat back to us what they've understood, what they've taken away from the encounter, not so much. Um, yeah. Some laughter, which uh, leads me to believe I'm not the only one that's happened to. Um, modifying patient beliefs and behavior, empowerment, ensuring patients understand the risks if they don't take the medications and consequences, positive <coughs> benefits and so on. And again, instead of sort of lecturing patients about this, asking them um, what they understand um, about the regimen, why it's important to them, how it might um, affect their functioning, their life, what matters to them most, right? We often think like, well, you know, of course, uh, hypertension is a leading risk factor for death worldwide. You really need to kind of manage that. But if that is not relevant to your young man, uh, relatively young man, who comes in with, uh, with, uh, with hypertension, uh, perhaps you can solicit or elicit from them reasons why they might want to do this, um, regardless of who the patient is. All right. Um, for example, we often think about other behavioral factors that are associated with, um, you know, overweight or obesity is important as well. And we might say, uh, bore the patient with all of our kinds of explanations for why this matters. And, and for them, maybe they want to look good at the beach. Maybe they want to, um, I don't know, start dating again and look. It, whatever the reason is that they want to engage in efforts, for example, to manage their weight, that is a good reason for them. And it's not terribly important why they're doing it, just that they're sort of doing something that's consistent with what we know works best for them. And believing that ultimately the patient knows what's good for them, but things get in the way. Uh, many things get in the way. Because remember that a lot of the behaviors that we ask patients to engage in are not normal behaviors. They're not the obvious or easy behavioral choice. Good health behaviors have normal choice. We heard from Deborah Reed this morning about diet and how difficult it is to maintain a successful sort of um, diet. Uh, you know, this is a function of being in an obesogenic society, and the paradox, of course, is there's terrible stigma around it. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, we're supposed to sort of um, drive everywhere and get on the escalator and, um, and eat uh, in a rapid and efficient manner with a lot of fast food, and at the same time, um, go out of our way to manage our weight. It's an um, interesting sort of paradox. So um, moving along then, providing communication and trust is important. Practicing active listening. For some of you in the room, I know that you are skilled and trained in this. Um, active listening doesn't mean sort of sitting there asking an open-ended question and allowing Pandora's box to open as you sort of you know, rub your eyes and wait for the person to finish. We know that like, um, from some very interesting research that when patients in primary care settings, for example, are asked uh, an open-ended question, that the uh, vast majority of them uh, finish within about 40 seconds. We also know that um, uh, in primary care, physicians interrupt uh, patients following an open-ended question after about 13 to 15 seconds. So there's a real mismatch there. And I think, uh, arguably, you know, uh, an exaggerated concern about this taking up a lot of time given the comp uh, competing demands that we have. We need to run them through the, the medications. We, need to, we have ethical responsibilities to attend to and so on. And so it takes a little bit of practice to steer the patient in a direction that makes sense. So um, one of the things that might be important to start off with on that note, uh, to kind of get the ball rolling, because um, if you're a, a beginner at this sort of um, consultative style, um, you need to start with something. A readiness assessment is not a bad idea. To ask the patient four very simple kind of straightforward questions. Do you consider your current behavior to be a problem? Because of course we're not sort of like when we're discussing managing chronic disease, we're not talking about the hypertension being a problem. We're talking about the behaviors that successfully manage the hypertension. That's the target, right? 
Um, that was the problem of the look ahead trial, for example, a major problem. They didn't report on any of the um, of those variables. Um, so with respect to, uh, to a readiness assessment, uh, do you consider the current behavior, non-adherence, for example, not taking your medication to be a problem? So there you're assessing acceptance. Is this per patient actually accepting what's going on, yes or no? Are they distressed by the current behavior? This is sort of uh, assessing sort of the, um, the emotional piece, which is often missed, right? We often do all these tests and so on, and we don't often ask patients, um, how are you feeling about this? Are you anxious? Are you depressed? We know that there's high comorbidity here. It's worth asking. Are you interested in changing this behavior, of course? And are you ready to change now? So four simple questions that will guide what it is that you can do next to move the person along the stages of readiness for change. So um, it doesn't really matter what the answer is. There's always something to do. If someone says, yeah, you know what, I've got a problem, I can't remember, it's non-intentional, uh, non-adherence, what can I do? Well, maybe you can give them advice then, offer them a list of, of suggestions. Um, if they're ambivalent about engaging in a particular behavior, stopping smoking, whatever, not sure it's the right time right now, then your task um, is to highlight that ambivalence, to ask them about the potential benefits, uh, the costs and benefits associated with the current behavior, how it fits with what matters to them most in their lifestyle. And if they're not ready, if they look kind of like, if they recoil when you ask them to uh, stop smoking or lose weight or ch consider changing their diet or whatever, um, then again, trying to understand what it would take for them to consider this possibility. What would need to change with their situation in order for them to, to consider uh, making the, uh, moving that direction? So uh, across the stages of readiness for change, important to sort of tailor the intervention appropriately. For people further along, ready to go, absolutely offer advice. Um, ask for permission and offer advice. For those earlier on in stages of change, it might be time to kind of spend a few moments figuring out uh, what might need to change, what the circumstances are that are necessary and sufficient for them to actually engage in change. So um, how might this look? Well, in a typical kind of encounter, um, in the traditional one, maybe it's not typical. I mean, I, I think for many of you in the room, you're, you're more sophisticated than this. But perhaps something like, um, you need to lose weight. Um, it'll help if you stick to the DASH diet. You need to check your blood glucose regularly. You need to stabilize that. If not, you know, there's serious health consequences associated with that. Come on now. The alternative approach would be, how important is it for you to do this? Why are these changes important? Why does it matter to you? Connecting the person, um, their behavior and their values and so on, which you know, arguably is a, a very reasonable strategy supported by a vast uh, array of research in behavioral sciences. You can imagine many of you, if you saw a patient with depressed mood come to see you, you wouldn't tell them, depression is really bad for you. You need to get up out of bed and fix that, okay, because you're going to lose your job, there's going to be occupational and social uh, you know, consequences, so can you do that for me? How about it? Good. Um, that, that would be ridiculous. But, you know, arguably this is what we do with the complex behavior change associated with managing a chronic illness. Uh, bias is important to address. We know that there's tremendous bias around some of the um, factors that are comorbid uh, with, uh, uh, with hypertension, uh, weight uh, being one of them. We know that, um, uh, that even among specialist physicians who deal with uh, overweight or obese individuals, that, uh, that, that bias exists. So, you know, this is sort of a ridiculous slide. Um, I'll let you read that for a second to help kind of uh, point this out. This is oftentimes, however, the way we deal with people who do come in and who have weight problems, who we tell them, uh, you know, who, who, we, who we counsel to lose weight, they come back, they haven't lost any weight. We treat them like this, don't we, sometimes? Huh? Or you, you, you imagine you've seen this in some settings. So we know there are these negative biases. These biases start very early in age. There's wonderful kind of evidence that it starts as early as three years of age with little kids reading, um, you know, uh, little silhouettes that are heavier as lazy and negative uh, relative to the thinner silhouettes. And we know that this extends all the way up into, um, into healthcare as well. The patients who are overweight or obese are often distressed and they're concerned about um, what they know is a problem um, and the reaction that they're gonna get from their provider. Finally, I'd like to mention that it's important to evaluate adherence at every visit. Uh, perhaps the most useless clinical question that I ever hear is, are you taking your medication as prescribed? Because the answer is always yes. Um, that, that's, a, that's a fact. Um, when you walk down the hallway and you ask someone, hey, how's it going? They will tell you, fine, thank you. Uh, it's the same sort of thing. People typically don't seem to say, terrible. Let me come and, come and talk to me about that for half an hour. Uh, with patients, of course, um, 
you know, a much better question would be, tell me a little bit about your medication re taking regimen. Many people have difficulties taking their medication as prescribed. Tell me about your experience. That's something like that, uh, that they can't answer with a, a yes or no. Uh, medication adherence scales are available. Um, this is kind of a time savings uh, measure, and you can kind of screen for, for adherence. The Mariski is a well-known, uh, very, very brief scale. You can give that to people while they're sitting waiting for their appointment. And it'll clue you in to whether you need to sort of follow up on this or not. If you suspect non-adherence, you can ask. So um, to summarize then, um, take home messages. Patience and empathy, obviously, when, asking, when, when dealing with patients, remember that the changes that you're asking them to engage in are obviously the more difficult behavioral choice. It's always easier to pull into the drive through and get a quick meal at the end of a, a busy kind of work day than go home and prepare food, right? So we have to remember that. Uh, to be mindful of the number of medications prescribed and frequency and dosing, of course, um, which is a, apparently a theme of the meeting this morning. Uh, discussing the consequences of non-adherence and ways of improving, but typically trying to elicit from patients some information about this. What have they tried? What have they found helpful? If they're not sure, to resist the temptation to provide simple, single, molecular sort of decisions for what they need to do, and instead offering them a menu of items. Um, you may even automate this, write it down, show them the list, ask them if any of them make sense to them and which ones they want to select. Uh, what else? Team-based care seems particularly important, um, including uh, uh, pharmacists. And identifying the roles and responsibilities, of course, um, to, um, to the patients so that they understand what they can expect when they are in the hypertension clinic and they are going to have an appointment with a nurse or a dietitian or the pharmacist. So they appreciate everyone's roles. Um, finally, a little bit of a pitch. We have uh, a group that has been developed in Canada, the Canadian Network for Health Behavior Change. Our website is coming soon. This is a group of, um, of uh, uh, academic healthcare providers across the country who are going to sort of organize to try to deliver consistent um, theory-based, um, evidence-based, and competency-assessed uh, training for, for, uh, for people who are interested. And of course, this is my contact info. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer some questions in the few minutes remaining.